Can we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for another day to come together and hold our camp meeting. We are so blessed and thankful for all the systems that you have put in place, Lord, that we could still meet together, fellowship, praise, and worship you as a church family. It is a tremendous blessing, Lord, and we ask you, we invite the Holy Spirit to be with us as we continue through this day, that we might, Father, all be enlightened by your truth, enlightened by your word. And may our faith be inspired, Lord, that despite the storm that's around us, we could rest in peace with you. And I pray for each one of us, Father, to be filled with your spirit, that we might glorify thee in all that we do and all that we say this day. We ask a blessing upon our speaker, Lord, that you would give him clarity of thought and clarity of mind and, uh, and speak the words that we need. May we all, Father, be hungry for righteousness and truth. We praise you and we thank you and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So I'm just going to open with a quick silent prayer. Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Uh, good, morning. good morning. So, I don't know if everyone is used to using Zoom. I think probably most people here use it um, pretty regularly. But I've been told, I don't often do this, or the Zoom function with video and everything, but I've been told that if you go to my box um, and you pin the video um, that it'll show up bigger on your screen. Um, you know, it'll take up the whole screen. So you can also put it on speaker view. And if we all mute and you're on speaker view, then they'll be able to um, have just. Okay. Um, at some point I do want, I mean, throughout the presentations, I do want some feedback and some uh, conversations. So um, probably better for everyone to just pin the video. It would be easier, I guess, when we get to those parts. Uh, okay. So just a quick overview of, of what I'm going to try to do. So my, uh, my agenda for today or for this weekend, is, today and tomorrow, is to first do some review. Um, some things some of us have already seen before, uh, maybe some haven't, uh, and sort of just set a framework uh, about the United States specifically. And then once we get done with that, we're going to start progressively moving to our main topic, which is the issue of equality. Um, I want to deal with the issue of equality at an individual level, but also at a uh, institutional or national level. Um, and then we will probably tomorrow wrap up with some, um, some other lines um, that are connected in that topic, but maybe not you know, I'll try to, I'll try to uh, make the connection for some of those things. So we'll look at the line of Christ and um, we'll look more deeply at uh, the United States. So that's sort of our overall plan. Uh, so we'll begin with a bit of a review. So uh, like I was saying before, I encourage any comments or feedback along the way. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, I'd rather it be more of a discussion than anything else. I assume as I go through this bit, um, sort of the, the review, um, it might be less interactive, but uh, I accept you know, any questions or anything. Um, but as we go further in some of the next presentations, uh, we will deal with that. Yeah, one quick comment. Yes. I'm gonna leave, because um, some people are not able to mute <coughs> their mics and, and be, whether, what, depending on the device they might be on. But anyways, I will be muting if there's background noise. But if they want to be unmuted and I don't manage to get them unmuted, put it in the chat box and we'll be watching the chat box. Yeah, and if you're using the phone, um, if you're using, calling from a phone and you want to make a comment, I think it is star six, you can mute and unmute yourself. Um, but if you want to say something, you can you know, either just unmute yourself and uh, start talking and I'll quickly pick up or uh, you can put the little hand, um, raising the hand. 
uh, though that might be harder for me to see because I'm going to have my notes up. So, but I'll try to see one second. I'll try to position. We'll be it. watching for it too. We'll be watching. Yeah. Okay. And just cut me off if, if I'm missing something. Yeah. Um, all right. Perfect. So let's begin with a uh, review of some things. So first thing I want to do is I want to lay out some, uh, a line of the United States and, um, and just get that as our base. So first thing. <clears throat> so one thing we're all familiar with is the agricultural model. Uh, we know that it can be broken up into four primary steps. First one is the plowing. And then our next step, we have the former rain, the time of the former rain. Then we have the latter rain. Followed by the harvest. And the agricultural model, um, along with the marriage model and construction um, and other minor ones um, are a couple of the ways uh, that we use in our methodology to, um, to check ourselves, I guess. I guess in and of themselves, they are methodology and they, are, um, they, they do lend to more light, but part of their function is to be able to check your work, I guess you could say it that way. Um, so, and they become filters, I guess. Um, they become filters of information. You know, you plug information in and it will give you an output. You know, it will give you your, uh, what you want to look at or what you are looking at through the lens of your, your different model. Um, so that's what we're going to try to do is we're going to use the agricultural model to look at uh, the United States. So, and we're not going to go over the agricultural model. I'm sure everyone here is, you know, familiar with it. So I'm just going to take, um, make that assumption. Okay, so the first thing we'll do is if we can go to, and sorry I don't have notes, um, I will be giving the references as I go, um, and we can read along, but I will be reading some quotes. So the first one we're going to go to is The Great Controversy, uh, GC 440, and we'll be on 440 and 441, GC 440 and 441. We're going to break down these two quotations. <clears throat> okay. So the context of uh, the quotation we're going to jump into, uh, it begins with, if you're looking, if you're finding these quotes, it begins with, what nation of the new world was in 1798 rising to power? So the context of this passage is that Ellen White is discussing the rise um she's discussing revelation 13 and the rise of this beast uh she's talking about both beasts the first beast and the second beast of revelation 13 but she's primarily going to focus on the second beast the united states and um tell us the characteristics of it and how it is fulfilling prophecy and she's going to eventually lead into the reform line of the millerites and whatnot but uh, what she's identifying here is the rise of the United States into its, um, its position, you know, of, in specifically the chapter of Revelation 13. So that's what we're cutting into. So I'll begin. What nation of the new world was in 1798 rising into power, giving promise of strength and greatness, and attracting the attention of the world? The application of the symbol admits of no question. One nation and one only meets the specification of this prophecy. It points unmistakably to the United States of America. Again and, again and again, the thought, almost the exact words of the sacred writer, the sacred writer being um, the, uh, John the Revelator, having been unconsciously employed by the orator and the historian in describing the rise and growth of this nation. The beast was seen coming up out of the earth. And according to the translators, the word here rendered coming up literally signifies to grow or spring up as a plant. So we'll stop there for just a moment. 
So Ellen White is discussing Revelation 13, and she is giving us um, this bit of information. And the bit of information there that we saw at the end is that she's describing the term or the phrase coming up out of the earth or that coming up uh, as that of a plant. So she's describing the agricultural model for us. She's giving us a, a piece of that puzzle. And we know that with God's word, um, there's no accident in it and there's no uh, haphazard use, I guess you could say. And so when we see that the term coming up out of the earth means or literally signifies, as she says, that they're springing up as a plant, we know, um, hopefully we know, and hopefully our uh, antennas go up to know that we now have touched the framework in the model of agriculture. So what we want to do is we want to look at Revelation 13 and how it fits and see how it fits in the context of Revelation 13, or sorry, um, the agricultural model. So what we saw so far is that, and let's turn to Revelation 13, if, if you would with me. Uh, Revelation 13 and verse 11. We'll just read the verse she's quoting from. Revelation 13, verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So we know this to be the United States, and that uh, this is the rise of the United States. It's the end, the end of the first beast, which is the papal beast, or the, the kings of Europe with the papacy. And we have the rise of the second taking its place of uh, the preeminent kingdom of Bible prophecy, uh, the United States, after the 1260. So, and as, uh, just to repeat that, she's saying the, t the phrase coming up out of the earth is signifying to come up as a plant. Now, what's interesting about that is not only does the grammatical interpretation of it, you know, if you look at the, the root of the word or whatnot, um, as Sister White is doing there, she sees the translation of it. Not only does it make sense from that perspective, um, but just the uh the visual of the of the uh verse of those couple those couple words actually gives you the same thing because when you see something coming up out of the earth the only things that come up out of the earth um are plants you know plants spring up out of the earth so it makes sense both contextually in terms of um you know the imagery being used but also uh grammatically or or in terms of the, the root word, I guess you could say, the translation of the word itself. Um, so both signify this idea of coming up out of the, uh, coming up out of the earth um, as a plant, as a plant does. So we'll stop there for just a moment with the passage and we'll come back to it uh, briefly in a moment. But what we've seen so far is that Revelation 13 can now be placed on this line here of the agricultural model. Now, our next problem that we have to figure out is where does it fall on this line and so um what does everyone think where would this fall from the information we have so far where would we place this passage uh revelation 13 11 particularly the part of it because we know revelation 13 11 spans a long period of time where would we place the idea of coming up out of the earth um any any thoughts Time of the end. Okay, time of the end. And time of the end is when for us, or when in this in in the context that you're describing. Uh, for the United States, 1798. So 1798. So why would you put it? So you're gonna put it at time of the end, but where are you going to place it? So we have 1798 is our um the date we'll put on it, but where do you want to place it on this line? Um in terms of the agricultural model. Forgetting, if we forget the date, where would we put the um, the context of the passage, or where would we put the event? Right on the line between the plowing and the former rain. Okay. Just the plant just coming up. So starting to come up. Amen. So Sister Debbie wants to place it here at this point. Uh, put it here. She wants to place it here between the plowing and the former rain. And Sister Debbie, what is happening at that point in terms of the agricultural model? You're just, I think you just said it, but if you could reiterate that. 
uh, seed has been put in and is is popping up through is just well the seed is planted and shortly will pop up above the surface of the soil. Yeah, so we have the planting of the seed, which takes place right after the plowing, right here. And then we have the seed, the germination, and the springing up of this plant uh, during the former rain time period, former rain. <laughs> so we have this plant popping up. So that is where we're going to place Revelation, Revelation 13.11 specifically the passage of, uh, or specifically the phrase coming up. Uh, and again, I'm making that distinction because we know Revelation 13, 11 covers a large period of time, uh, the beginning to the end of its history. But this, that particular phrase is placing us right here in this agricultural model. Now, Sister Elaine gave us another point. She gave us the idea that, um, the, she gave us the historical reference or the date of this um, thing that is happening. So the coming up, uh, this, this beast coming up out of the, the earth takes place at 1798. So we can put a date on this as well. So we'll put the date of 1798 here, 1798 for Revelation 13 verse 11. So what, what, and what do we see at this point? Um, and let me ask that better. What problem do we see initially from this? Any thoughts? It's leaving the plowing phase out altogether. Okay, so we haven't dealt with the plowing phase. Um, and we'll come back to that in a minute. We're going to fill all that in. But what, so Sister Lane, what did you say 1798 represents? Time of the end. Time of the end. Now, in the agricultural model, where is the time of the end? It's before the seed gets planted. It's before the seed gets planted. So, I'm, so we've placed the date of 1798, which we would normally place here, when the seed gets, or sorry, before the plowing, when this process begins. We've now taken 1798 and brought it away from that point, uh, from this point, and we brought it actually to the point where the former rain begins and it's the end of the plowing. Now, the question is, can we do that? And let's get some thoughts. Can we do that? And if so, why? Putting the plowing before 1798, you said? Yes. Can you put the plowing before 1798? Or to put it another way, can you take 1798, that, that date that we use, and place it at the beginning of the former end? Just thinking about how Ellen White says 1798 marks it as the time of the end. Yeah, so we have to, we have to understand the quotation. Right. Um, right. Anyone else? Any other thoughts? Well, we're working with models. And if she also presents another model that shows different characteristics happening in different places, we could talk about what she calls as time of the end is the time of the end for us. Oh, my mom says what she calls the time of the end is the time of the end for us. Who's the us? The church. The church, she says. Okay, so you guys are touching on it. So any, any other thoughts about why we can or can't do this and how we would explain that discrepancy? Oh, because it's the church is one time of the end, but we're talking about the United States as a whole. Yeah. yeah. Amen. So we're looking at, it, to put it simply, we're looking at two different models. So in one aspect, we're looking at either the church or we're, we're looking at the church um, or, or even if it wasn't the church, if we said it was something else, we would be looking at 1798 in the different perspective or at a different model. And all we're doing here is we're taking that date and we're seeing that in one aspect, it can be here. And in one aspect, it can be here, depending on the model in which you're using, depending on the context. 
depending on what you're looking at. So 1798 is not always the time of the end based upon um, your context. And what we've done so far, just to reiterate it, um, hopefully it's been simple enough, but we said we have our agricultural model. And what we're going to do is we're going to see that Revelation 13 can fit on that agricultural model. And what we did is we saw that the phrase coming up means um, springing up as a plant. And we know that that takes place here. And we said, okay, well, what date can we put on that, on that event? When does the United States come up? And we know that it's 1798. So that's where this plant is springing up. And the problem we raised is that, well, how do we deal with that when it comes to the issue of, um, with the issue of 1798 normally being the time of the end? And I'd like to suggest that it just is it's as simple as depending on the context you're looking and depending on the model you're using, it can change positions. Um, hopefully that makes sense. And like, and like our sister said, we're looking at the United States uh, as a on its own reform line. Um, okay, and so I hope that makes sense. Is that clear? Does anyone have any questions about that? Thoughts? Okay, so let's continue. So, so far, what we have is we have 1798 being uh, in Revelation 13, 11, placing us at this point of the transition from the plowing to the former rain. Now, the problem we have at this point is that we only have one point on this line and we have to fill this whole model up. Um, now, the amazing thing about uh, methodology and using these models is that if you have one point on the line, you can then figure out the rest of the line. You can then figure out all the other points because it becomes your anchor. So we have one anchor point, and because of that, we can construct the plowing history beforehand and all the history that comes afterwards as well, um, now that we have this one anchor point uh, to work with. So what we want to do now is we want to start constructing this line. Now, for sake of time, um, in this weekend, we're not going to fill out the entire line. We're only going to focus on uh, a portion of it. We're going to for po mostly for focus on the... Uh, the beginning portion with the plowing. Um, but we'll mention some of the other parts of it uh, as we go. Now, simply, um, just to give us, you know, just some uh, thought about that, because um, we're not gonna touch on it in depth. Um, since we said that this is a line that's depicting the, the, the rise and fall of the United States, which we know to be, <laughs> which begins in 1798 and ends um, during the Sunday Law Crisis, we sort of already know some of our dates. We, we know the beginning and the end um, to some degree. Now, we're gonna look at the history before 1798, um, but we know really where this line ends. It ends um, in the history that leads to the close of probation, you know, the Sunday Law Crisis, um, and, and all the things that take place there. That's what brings the United States down. And this can be easily seen if you look at Revelation 13, 11, which we're all familiar with, we know that that verse covers the rise and the fall of that whole beast um, in the context of it coming up out of the earth. Um, so in that context, we know that it must, that the, the how, would you, how would I say that? The... Um, there's the rise and the fall, basically, is all I'm trying to say, um, depicted in that verse. And we know when this ends. Um, we know when the United States ends. So the next thing we have to determine is, you know, we could put any dates on there. You know, I could take any date from U.S. history and I can put it on this line. You know, I could say the plowing begins in, you know, um, We'll say 1690, random date, 1690, the uh, time of the end, sorry, the, um, the plowing happens. Um, and then I can say, okay, random date for the former rain and the latter rain, this line here, we could say this is, um, you know, 1823, again, a random date. Now, why, how do we, how do we make sure that we're not just putting random dates 
on this line and just filling in with random things? How do we, how do we determine that? That we're making, that we're putting the correct thing at the correct place. You mean you spirit of prophecy quotes to guide us or what do you mean? Okay, so one thing I can do is I can use spirit of prophecy quotes to uh, guide us in that process. Um, though I would suggest that you can't, the problem with spirit of prophecy quotes is you have to first figure out what she means and then you have to figure out how it applies to what you're doing. Um, because, and um, that process can have some itself. problems. Say that again? Because history repeats itself and therefore from, um, from one event to another, it has its characteristics. Um, yeah, that's part of it. Part of it is the repetition of history. Um, and we'll, we'll talk more about that. Anything else? How do we determine that the, the date before? So what we have so far is we have an anchor point that we know is correct because the model, it's simple with the model that we're using, the agricultural model, but also the, in the context of, um, we, we also have a spirit of prophecy quote. So we have the agricultural model, the verse, and the uh, spirit of prophecy quote, and they all line up together. So we have our anchor point. Now, we may not have quotations for the, for the point before and the point after, so we have to figure out how we would determine that. So, and that, that is our, our question, I guess you could say. Um, how do we determine those points? Is it in the development of the increase of knowledge and the formalization of the message? Okay. Well, that is that. Well, that's going to be part of it, and you're you're getting you're getting to the thought in that something a message is going to develop throughout this this model, this agricultural model. A message or a thought is going to develop um, through the increase of you know increase of knowledge, depending on what that what that is here, and it's going to run through the um, the line. So, what is that? What is what, what's another way of saying what the message is for this line? What would we call that? Present truth. Say it again. Present truth. Okay, present truth. So, so let me say it simply. Um, if you had a message that runs from the beginning of this line and it's going to increase and you're going to get more and more information about that, what is that message to this line? if it runs all the way through and it's going to give you the characteristics of it. It's the theme. It's the theme of the line. So we have to determine what the theme of this line is um, in order to be able to rightly um, sift out the dates or the events on this line. You know, so like I said, we could put anything at the beginning or any, you know, where the plowing is or the latter rain or the harvest, we could put any date, and, you know, maybe we can even find a, a correct justification for it. But what we know we have to do is we have to run a theme all the way through this line from the beginning to the end. And so for us to be able to do that, um, for us to give the right things, the right, the right um, waymarks, we have to find the theme that can thread itself through all these waymarks and connect itself. Um, because to give an example of that, if we start this line and we say, okay, We'll start with plowing, and then we're gonna have the seed being sown and the rain come down. And then I say, okay, here's the next thing. The next thing is that we're going to uh, build a house. What would you say? You would say you've done something wrong because you're breaking the theme, that doesn't make sense. The context of this line is that you're going to plow a field, then you're going to have some rain, plant some seed, and then there's going to be a lot of rain and a harvest. There's no building on that line. That doesn't make sense contextually. It breaks the model. Um, it breaks the theme. To bring in something outside of the theme um, would break the line for us and show us that something's wrong. So we know we have to figure out the theme. And the question is, how do we determine theme? How do we do that? Any thoughts? How do we determine theme? From the, would it be the, from would it, go ahead, Debbie. <laughs> no, I'm just going to say from a verse, we determine what is the, what are the key words, 
or phrase that that highlights what the theme is, the subject? Okay. I, I was sort of on the same uh, wavelength as Debbie. I was thinking of the thread of um, content that's running through uh, what we're trying to understand the paragraph or whatever. Okay. Um, also, if you have a date, a date is an event. You could take any, a theme from an event, maybe? Yeah, yeah. So we could take something that happens in 1798 and, you know, depending on, again, the context and, and um, find a theme in there. Uh, yeah, all those works work and you should do them together. So let's do what, um, what you all have suggested. What is the theme of the con, what is the theme or the context or the important words of um, the passage we're looking at? So we're looking at Revelation 13, 11. That's the verse we're looking at but we're also looking at the spirit of prophecy quote, but let's stay to Revelation 13. Um, what is the important word or the context of Revelation 13? Beast. Okay, so we have a beast. How many beasts do we have? We have two beasts. We have two beasts. And what do we know about these two beasts? Um. One comes up from the sea and one comes up from the earth. Yeah, geographical differences. One's a lamb, one's a dragon. We have geographical differences. One's a lamb, one's a dragon. Um, so... in the theme be the coming up part of this, this beast? If we're focusing on the line for the USA. So if we're looking... So growth, part of it, would growth be be sort of the theme say that again sorry wouldn't growth be the theme like coming up yeah that growth? is absolutely that would be part of the theme as well the growth of this um and so we have to understand the verse itself what the verse is saying and, and create uh enough of the picture from the verse as we can or to create as much as we can i guess um from that from that verse. But then the next thing we have to do is we have to look around the verse before and after um, to get the context of what's being said in this passage. So a couple of people have said there's this contrasting theme in this in Revelation 13. The contrast uh, can be seen in several different ways. What ways can we see the contrast? Geography. The first beast comes from, we said the first beast comes from the sea. Uh, and we'll break that up for a second. Uh, first beast. So C, and the second beast comes from the land. So one comes from the sea, one comes from the land. We're looking at geography. What other contrast, contrasting thoughts do we see there? Their appearance, how they speak, where they get their power. Okay, their appearance. So what do we know about their appearance? One's a conglomerate of different animals, and the other one is a lamb and dragon. So you have the leopard-like and then the lamb-dragon beast. Okay, so let's deal with the first one. What is the first beast um, like? What, um, what, what, is the, what is its composition? Leopard, lion, bear, and am I missing anything? Yeah, leopard, the lion. And what do we know about all those? What what is the what is the similarity with all those beasts? They're the mean. Is beasts. there a similarity? They're the mean beasts of the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> they're mean. Okay, they're mean. So what's another way of saying they're mean? The predators. Mm -hmm. So you have a um, a leopard, a lion, and a bear and a dragon, and all these beasts are predator beasts. They eat things, you know, they're destructive in nature, um, aggressive, you know, all those different words fit. Um, so I will put, we'll put predators. So this first beast can be described as a predator. Now, what's the contrast to that in the passage? The lamb. The lamb. So the lamb is the contrasting thought to these 
these predators. And what is a lamb? A lamb is prey. It is literally prey for all of those things. Um, it's the prey beast. So you have the contrast of geography. One is from the sea, one is from the land. One is a predator, one is a prey. So what we can see about these beasts is that they're opposites of each other, sort of. Now, the reason I say sort of is that we know that the second beast is going to have horns like a lamb, but it's going to speak like a dragon. So what, we can, what can we determine from that, that um, from the speaking and the, the horns on the same beast? Is it like a dictator? Okay, and you're saying because of the fact that there's um, from the dragon? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, part of it. There's a contradiction. There's a contradiction. There's a contradiction that's taking place between the, the predator aspect of the, of the beast and the prey aspect of the beast. Um, you know, a lamb and a dragon don't make sense together, but a, a leopard, a lion, a bear, and a dragon do make sense together. You know, there's a consistency with, uh, between those symbols. Um, while there is not for, there's no consistency between a dragon and a dragon. So there's a contradiction in this place. There's something wrong there. Like a wolf in sheep's clothing. <laughs> like a wolf in, exactly. Like a wolf in sheep's clothing. There's some sort of, um, I guess you could say it this way, contradiction or hypocrisy that takes place. Um, at minimum, a contradiction, but we, we understand um, that it's a, it's a hypocrisy that's going to take place. Um, cognitive, cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance, yeah, exactly. Um, holding two, two ideas or two thoughts at the same time in contradiction with each other. Um, exactly. So what we know so far is that these two beasts are opposite for the most part, but there's some sort of discrepancy in the second beast. Um, we'll talk about that later. So let's just focus on the contrasting part right now. So without taking a lot of time, um, cause we want to move through this, um, and we're all mostly familiar with this, I'm sure, uh, with these, these aspects. Um, when we look at the Let, let's bring in some of our knowledge that we know. Um, so normally you wouldn't want to do this if you're trying to break it down. You want to start fresh and then um, only use what you have uh, in the passages to determine your thought. But if we were to go through, it'd be easy to see anyway. Um, and we're all familiar with this thought. So the first beast we said is who? Who's the first beast? The, the papal beast in Europe. Okay, the papal beast in Europe. It's the ten yeah. kings ruling with the. Uh, it's the kings of Europe ruling with the beast. Uh, sorry, with the um, with the uh, papacy. Um, so what do we know about? When did that occur? We already know the answer to that. When did that occur? You mean the twelve sixty? Exactly, the 1260. So the occurrence of this, this, the life of this beast is from when to when? You mean 538 to 1798? 538 to 1798, exactly. 538 to 1798. This is a 1260. We're all familiar with that. So the 1260 is depicted or is um, the time of rulership of this first beast that's described as the sea and as a predator uh, through its composite animals. So this beast, this sea beast and, or sorry, this uh, beast coming up out of the sea, this predator, what, what do we know about, if we didn't know anything about this beast, about its actions, what could we determine about its actions? About the its actions, yeah, its character, its character. Um, because of the animals that it is representing, it you'd see it's a very dominating pot power. Dominating, aggressive, yeah, um, predatorial, you Violent. know, all those kind of things. 
Um, if we had no information, we could determine that, that this is a, a not nice beast, obviously. Um, this is not a beast you want to be around. The, so if we didn't know anything about the other beast, the second beast, the United States, what could we determine? We could determine through what we've seen so far is that it's the opposite of the first beast. So if this first beast is a dominating, aggressive, persecuting power, then the opposite of that would be exactly that. It, it would be a um, docile, gentle um, prey that is not persecuting, that is the opposite of persecuting, which, I, which would be freedom, is a, or a um, liberal beast, I guess you could say, uh, or a tolerant beast. So the compare and contrast of these two beasts is really important when we start looking at, when we start trying to identify the characteristics of these two beasts um, and what they're going to do, their actions. So we know, again, taking, in the, taking into account the information that we already have uh, for sake of time, we know that the 1260 is described as a time of persecution, of domination, of aggression, um, of martyrdom, um, of, you know, just all the bad things we know about the 1260, just to use some of the adjectives there. Um, which means that the time period after that, when this next beast comes up, that its rulership or its domain is going to be the opposite of that, at least for a time until the dragon part kicks in and, and that um, comes into play. But while the gentleness of the lamb is present, it's going to be the opposite of these beasts. So let's, um, let's go back to our Let's go back to our, um, how do I, uh, let's go back to Revelation, not Revelation 13, sorry. Let's go back to our quotation, Great Controversy 440 and 441. So we read the quote on page 440, but I want to look at the quote on page 441. Uh, so we're just going to skip a couple sentences and jump to the next part. So we are on Great Controversy 441, and we will begin with the passage that starts, and he had two horns like a lamb. <clears throat> okay. So she's quoting from Revelation 13, the next characteristic, and he had two horns like a lamb. So just remember everything we just said that we got from just looking at the logic of a, a lamb and a dragon, you know, looking at the contrast between the two, that's exactly what Ellen White's going to do. She's going to simplistically say, look, this is what a lamb is like, and it fits the character of the United States. And he had two horns like a lamb. The lamb-like horns indicate, you, indicate youth, innocence, and gentleness, fitly representing the character of the United States when presented to the prophet as coming up in 1798. The Christian exiles who first fled to America sought an asylum from royal oppression and priestly intolerance. They determined to establish a government upon the broad foundation of civil and religious liberty. Okay. So, before, or first, let's just break this down. Okay, let's stop there for just a moment. So, She's saying we have this two-horned beast. It's like a lamb coming up uh, in the United States, coming up out of the, uh, coming onto the scene of action in 1798. So the next thing she says is she's going to go into a little bit of history, and she's going to say the Christian exiles who fled to America um, sought asylum from royal oppression and priestly intolerance. What is, what is she doing in this sentence here? Um, the one that's called, uh, the one that starts with the Christian exiles. What do we see about what is significant that Ellen White does in this sentence here? Dividing those exiles into two groups. Okay. What else? What else does she do? Let me give you a... Um, a hint on this, I guess, uh, about where we're angle, where we're going. Um, what methodology is she using in this sentence? What does she do? 
Do you mean because she's comparing the, the uh, trait of the United States with Christianity? Um, no, not necessarily that. Uh, I mean, that I'm asking what, um, so let me just read the sentence again, now that you have the question. So here's the question again. What methodology is Sister White using in this sentence? Compare and contrast. Compare and contrast, thank you. And we'll just read it one more time. The Christian exiles who first fled to America sought, to, sought uh, an asylum from royal oppression and priestly intolerance. So what is royal oppression? Priestly, well, read that again, that last part. It was that last part, those two things. <laughs> What, uh, what, no, what is it? What is royal oppression? Kingly rule. Power. It, it's kingly power. The royal oppression. And what is priestly intolerance? It's religious con restrictions, um, bigotry. So it's, it's religious in nature. So she's saying the kings were being oppressive and the priests were being oppressive. The church was being oppressive. So to say it another way, there's oppressive state. There's an oppressive state power and there's a oppressive church power as well. Do we see that? And then what does she do? Um, my sister who said uh, that she doesn't compare and contrast. What is she going to compare and contrast now? She's comparing and contrasting. Um, well, that's what she was. I thought that's what it was. She was comparing and contrast the priestly intolerance and the royal oppression. So you're right that she's comparing and contrasting, um, but you're missing the, the point she's doing okay. it with. So Church she's state. contrasting both of those with the civil and religious liberty. Amen. Okay. So what she does is she gives you, she says the, the Christian exiles who fled Europe were running from an oppressive state and an oppressive church. And what were they running to? Or what were they going to do now? They were going to establish a government in contrast with the governments that they had just left, this, this oppressive church and state relationship that was happening. And they're going to, um, they're going to establish a government on, the contra on contrasting principles. They're going to found their government on the broad foundation of civil and religious liberty. So what is civil liberty? What is civil liberty? That the people rule themselves. The right to follow your conscience. Okay. Um, broadly, very, very broad. In terms of in terms of what we're looking at, in terms of so we know what religious liberty is. It is freedom right. of religion, which is to do with church. And civil liberty has to do with what? State. The state power. So the state. So they were going to found their government on the opposite ideas of royal oppression and priestly intolerance. They were going to establish their state on the contrasting principles of civil liberty and religious liberty, the opposite of what they saw before. So using what we have so far, using what we saw so far, we know that this is the the royal oppression and the priestly intolerance is the character of the first beast. And those who are going to eventually establish the United States are going to do the opposite of that. And they're going to establish their government on these, on liberty. We'll just say generically liberty. So the first beast, this is the predatorial, um, aggressive, dominating, um, characteristic it's the royal oppression and priestly intolerance but that lamb-like characteristic is this civil and religious liberty as you can see in this compare and contrast okay does that make sense to everyone mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So what we're going to do now is we're going to go to the next, we're going to, uh, next sentence. We're going to try to finish off this paragraph. So next sentence. The Declaration of Independence sets forth the great truth that all men are created equal and endowed with inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the Constitution guarantees to the people the right of self-government, providing that representatives elected by, pop, by the popular vote shall enact and administer the laws. Freedom of religious faith was also granted every man being permitted to worship God according to the dictates of his conscience. Re Republicanism and Protestantism became the fundamental principles of the nation. These principles are the secret of its power and prosperity. So let me ask this question. What methodology is she using now in that the rest of what we just read? So we said that she begins by giving us a compare and contrast. She says, this is where they were and this is what they want to be, this is where they want to be and what they're gonna found the new government on. So it's a compare and contrast. What did she just do now? She gave more information, so would that be repeat and enlarge? So yes, she's giving us a repeat and enlarge, but how is she giving us a repeat and enlarge? Of what? Of what? What is she repeating and enlarging on? the traits of yeah church and state okay yes the the traits of church and state on which side of the equation is she talking about the bad side or the good side the good side the good side and what what and she's going to take out some key words to describe um to describe these things i mean we can take some key words rather um to describe these two things and so let me I'll, I'll help us with that because it's, it's a bit of a, you know, without breaking down the sentences. Um, so the first thing she's going to say, she's going to say the Constitution guarantees to the people the right of self-government. What is self-government? It is people? the idea it, that, that you rule yourself. It is civil liberty. So she's going to say um, self-governance. self government so she says self-governance. And then the next thing she says is she says, um, providing that the representatives elected by the popular vote shall enact, the, shall enact and administer the law. And then she says, next sentence, freedom of religious faith was also granted, or freedom of religion. So she says they have self-governance and freedom, what did she say? Freedom of uh, relig religion. Freedom of religion. Freedom of religion. So, as you can see, civil self-governance is a repeat and large of civil liberty, and freedom of religion is a repeat and large of religious liberty. So, and they're both pretty obvious. Now she's going to do this one more time. How does she do it next? What's the final way she does it in this sentence or in this passage? Is this juxtapositioning? Turn it, you know. Is it, so juxtapositioning would be comparing, it's just another way of, of doing compare and contrast or another way of saying that. So to juxtaposition would be to take civil liberty and religious liberty and put, and say that there's a good form of that. Or sorry, to say, let me say it this way. To take church and state and say that there's a good church and state and to juxtapose it with a bad church and state. So she's taking the two beasts, the first beast and the second beast, and she's juxtaposing them, putting them side by side okay. um, to, to highlight the differences between them. Um, so if I could say it this way, if you go horizontally, that is juxtaposition, but vertically is a repeat and enlarge, you know, where she's repeating on that same thought. So what is the final way that she's going to do a repeat and enlarge in this pa paragraph here? I don't know. <laughs> Any thoughts? Anyone? So I repeat the question, please. 
there's so I gave you the first one. I said she does her first repeat and large is she says self governance and freedom of religion, which is civil uh, state and church, but from the positive perspective. But she's going to do this one more time. What are the two entities she's going to use now to describe church and state once more? In that pair, in that. Uh, mm -hmm. I was thinking the Declaration and Constitution, but then you said church, so now I'm, hmm. No, it's not the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, because those two are the same thing. Um, and by same thing, I mean they're both talking about civil liberty. Do you mean republicanism and Protestantism? Republicanism and Protestantism, amen. That's so, what I was looking at. Um, yeah. She's going to say, you also have republicanism and Protestantism. What is republicanism? Civil government. It has to do with civil government, but what is its tenets? How do what is it? What does it say? Oh. No king and no pope. So no king would be republicanism because you have your if you're a republic you are based on the idea of representative government. That's what a republic is. Um, and Protestantism, Protestantism would be the church aspect of that. So again, in, in another way to say that, if we wanted to figure out what, pro, what republicanism is and Protestantism is, but we don't know, we could look at the repeat and enlarge to help define that. So republicanism is the same as self-governance and civil liberty. Protestantism is the same as freedom of religion and religious liberty. So Protestantism is religious liberty. Republicanism is civil liberty. Now, what's the problem with that? Or there's no problem with that. Let me sit, let me ask that differently. Um, what is profound about this quotation, this paragraph, is if you use compare and contrast and repeat and enlarge as we did, as we're doing here, um, it gives you, it paints you a picture where it defines your terms as we just did. You can figure out what Republicanism means. You can figure out what Protestantism means. And what's profound about that is it answers one of the questions that um, Christians often have about the United States. So the context of this is that the United States is built up of people who, who ran away from this system, the system of oppressive church, state and oppressive church. They ran away and they're going to found a new system on civil and religious liberty. And um, they're going to do the opposite of what they were, what was happening before. And one of the things that, and, and Sister White says that this, the, this doing the opposite of what happened before is the secret of their power and prosperity, I think, is as she says it. Let me just read that part. Uh, Protestantism, Republicanism and Protestantism became the fundamental principles of the nation. These principles are the secret of its power and prosperity. So the power, the secret of the power and prosperity of the United States is that it is a, oh, one second. It is a civil, it has civil liberty and religious liberty um, or Protestantism and Republicanism. And what's amazing about this is, is that oftentimes when Christians think about the United States, I would say that this is most Christians in the United States. When they say what makes America so great, um, it's because they describe the United States as a Christian nation, a nation built on Christianity. When in reality, it's the exact opposite. The reason the United States is great is not, and I don't mean that Christianity isn't good, I don't mean it that way, but it's not built on Christianity in, in the sense that it is, it doesn't endorse religion. So technically, the U.S. government, as founded uh, by the Constitution, is a secular government. It recognizes no God, and it recognizes no religion. It is you know, it is, a, it is a secular government. Um, it has no perspective 
or no opinion on any god. All gods are good and no gods are good. Either one works for the Constitution. Um, and that is actually the power of the United States is that it doesn't endorse religion or it doesn't, um, it doesn't endorse religion through the state, I guess you could say that way. It doesn't, um, it doesn't have that church and state relationship. It's not a Christian nation. Um, it's a secular nation um, built up of all sorts of different people um, that can coexist. And that is the, that unity and that harmony of coexisting or being able to coexist is part of its, uh, its power that allows for that tolerance of all religions. Um, as opposed to this system here, this system said, no, we're going to use the state to enforce our dogma. Uh, and this being the Catholic church. So the Catholics are in control of the state and they say, okay, church, our state, sorry, we want you to enforce our dogmas, our rules, because we are a Christian. We are a Catholic nation. We're a Catholic empire and we need those laws enforced. So in reality, the United States is the opposite of that. It, it recognizes no God, as we know, um, or recognizes no religion. Um, and there's a difference between the people being, you know, religious and versus the institutions or the document documents of the nation being um, religious in nature. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But what I want us to see is that it, this quotation, this passage, um, puts that to bed to some degree. Um, at least for you know anyone who would read Ellen White and uh, and be willing to see it from this perspective. Um, another thing, just to reiterate that, just a little bit differently. Um, a lot of a lot of people say that. So let me say it this way. Let me say it just a little bit differently. Protestantism here does not refer to the endorsement of religion. It is something else. Now, how would we, let me ask this, uh, let me ask it this way. Where does Protestantism come from? We were protesters of Rome. Protesters of Rome. Who was protesters of Rome? Uh, the, the Protestants. <laughs> the what? The oh, the okay, the Protestant. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's circular there. Um, so the Protestants, the Protestants are protesting Rome. Um, the, correct. The prince. Correct. The prince of Germany. Oh, the princes. The princes. Thank, Thank you. you. The princes were the ones who were protesting Rome. So, if you look at the original, the original definition or the original thought of Protestantism, um, where the name comes from. Let me say it that way. Where the 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 name of Protestant comes from is not from Martin Luther. You know, it's not from Martin Luther, it's not from Wycliffe, it's not from these religious leaders. They have all, they have already um, done their work or are doing their work. Um, some, it depends who you're talking about at this point in the, in the history. But um, at this point in the history, Protestants, um, the, how do I say it? The religious aspect of Protestantism, the idea, what Martin Luther did, what Wycliffe did has already happened. Now they're seeing the ramifications of that and nobody's being called a Protestant. That's not what they called Martin Luther or these other people. Um, they call them heretics. Um, but what they're, where the name comes from is, as our brother said, is it comes from the Diet of Spire, Spires. And what happened here is that there was a um, confrontation between the princes of Germany and the um, the the magistrate or the uh the officials of rome um and what happens is that they come together and the the uh the church says the um the catholics say okay we want you to do this um they we want you to continue doing what we've asked you to do because some of you have stopped some of you are having problems and we need you to get back on track with the church's uh, agenda. You need to be enforcing it. And the princes, the German princes come and they say, no, we're not going to enforce your dogma anymore. We are going to, um, you're a church, we're princes, so we're the state, and you shouldn't be telling us how to run our governments. So Protestantism means 
the protest of a church and state relationship. It's saying we don't want a church and state relationship, and it doesn't matter if you're actually Christian or not. It has nothing to do with whether you're Christian or not. It's the idea of protesting the combination of church and state. Does that make sense? So when we say Protestant here, it's not an endorsement of a, of a set of beliefs in terms of um, religion. You know, it doesn't say, it's, you're not endorsing um, Christianity by saying Protestantism. What you're endorsing is religious liberty, which is found through the separation of church and state. The separ separating the church and separating the state and saying that they have nothing to do with each other and the churches can do what they want and the state is going to do what they want and they can stay in their, their domains um, and not cross paths or not cross over. Um, that is what Protestantism is. And that works with any religion. Any, any person that finds themselves opposed to the combination of church and state is technically, by its original sense, a Protestant. Whether you're a Muslim that doesn't think the combination of church and state should take place, or whether you're a, a Hindu or even a Satanist, if you believe in the separation of church and state, you're a Protestant by its original context and definition in the way Sister White is using it here in this context. Um, so it is, this is not an endorsement of the Protestant religion. It's an endorsement of separating church and state. Um, is that clear to everyone? Yeah, that's pretty cool because that's, um, that's a really cool way because I didn't realize that or know that to share that, you know, to share that. That's a, a good share. Amen. With anyone. So what we've seen so far in this is we've seen the, the methodological question that we were asking. We've seen Ellen White do a compare and contrast. She, or a juxtaposition, as we were saying, she's going to take the first beast and contrast it with the second beast. So that's the first thing she does. And then she takes the second beast and she repeat and enlarges about its characteristics. And she gives us this uh, two repeat and enlarges. Um, and, and so those are the two points of methodology we see in this passage here, um, the repeat and enlarge and the compare and contrast. Um, what this also helps us do is answer the question of theme. You know, we, talk, we were talking before about how do we determine the theme of, these, um, of, this, of this line that we're looking at, and this is part of it. This is actually the way that we're doing it. The first thing we said was, okay, we, look, we see these beasts, and we know that one is a predator, one is a prey. Uh, one is oppressive, one is liberal, I guess you could say in that way. Um, and now we've put a little bit more meat on those bones, and we've said, well, how is it oppressive? And how is it liberal? Or how is it gentle, gentle like a lamb? And we said, one is oppressive through its church-state relationship and the fact that the church is oppressive and the state is oppressive. And the other one is the opposite of that, the, the lamb, in that it, is, it endorses civil liberty and religious liberty. So our theme is the conflict between at least in part, this is our theme, is the conflict between oppression and liberty in the context of the United States being the second beast and the first beast being the um, European powers or the European, the kings of Europe ruling with Rome. Uh, so that is how we're, we've determined thus far our theme um, for this line. So what we need to look at, if we want to see what's the beginning of this, what is the beginning of the plowing? in the context of the United States in this line here, it's going to be, it's gonna to have to do with the, the tension or the controversy over oppression versus liberty, um, at least in a general sense. And then you can narrow that down a little bit in, in the idea of civil, civil liberty and religious liberty uh, versus royal oppression or state oppression and church oppression. Um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to just, um, we're going to look at one more thing and then we're going to start filling in our line. But we have to just address one more question about this line. <coughs> so question. What is the, what is the point 
of the agricultural cycle. Produce fruit. Produce fruit. Yeah, I was going to say the same. The end. The end point. The, the end point. The, the, the result. Production. The result of the fruit. <laughs> so, you don't just plow a field because it's a nice day and you feel like plowing a field. You plow a field because you have a end goal in mind and that end goal is a harvest. You want to go from this field to a harvest, but what kind of field do you have at this point before you plow? Fallow? You have a fallow field. So this field is barren. We could say it that way. It is a unproductive field. So what is that in the context of the agricultural cycle? What is the fallow field in the context of the agricultural cycle? Unfruitful. It is unfruitful, yes. Um, think more, uh, I don't know the best way to ask this. Let me say, let me ask you this. If the, if the plowing is the, sorry, if the, if the goal, so let's identify some pieces. So the goal of your, what you're going to do is to produce fruit. That's your goal. Now, what is the problem? If you have a goal, it means that it's on at the, at the moment of you making your goal, it is unfulfilled. It has not happened yet. What do you have to do? You need to, you need to put something into action. You need to do something in order to achieve your goal. So mm -hmm. the action would be what? Prepare the ground. Prepare the ground. All the steps required. All the steps required. Something, something that's not producing, not living. Amen. And make it living and producing. So all the steps along the way would be the action you're going to take. It's your action plan. You know, the first thing we'll do is we'll plow. The second thing we'll do is we'll have some um, water and then we'll have more water and we'll have some sunlight. We'll plant some seeds and whatnot and then we'll harvest. We'll get to the end goal. So you're going to have these, this action plan that you have. Um, <clears throat> but there's one more thing that um, has to get dealt with and that is the field. So what is the field in this? So you have the, the goal is the harvest. The action is the steps along the way, but we'll say the action primarily, or at least at the beginning, is the plowing work. So what is the barren field? It's the obstacle. It's the thing that's in the way. So you have a problem, if I could say it that way. The problem is you have this fallow field. And this fallow field is full of all these thorns and thistles, and it's just standing in your way, and you need to address that problem. So this is your problem, and this is your solution. Does that make sense? So let's think about this from a slightly different perspective with problem and solution. Or let me say, let me say it this way. Um, in, the, in the context of a reform line, what is this way mark here, this first way mark? Sister Lane said it earlier in the earlier in the class. Time of the end. The time of the end. So this is the time of the end. What comes at the time of the end? What comes at the time of the end? A message. A message comes. So a message arrives. And what is that message? What is the job of that message? Increase? Um, it is going to increase, but that's not what it's there to do. 
it's not there to increase. It will increase, but the message is, it ha it's there for a reason. What's the reason it's there for? To do a work. To separate. What, what work does it need to do? Create to two solve. groups of people. Okay, create two groups of people. That's part of the work it will do. It's gonna work on the heart. It's gonna work on the heart. So why does a message need to, need to come at all? Say that again. Why does a message need to come at all? Because there was a period of darkness beforehand. And what does the darkness represent oh, in that context? To bring light. <clears throat> it comes to shine light in the darkness. To shine light in the darkness? So what is the darkness? It's a scattering. Okay, it's a scattering. Uh, but in keep. So if I give you a message and I'm giving you a message, we'll say message is, message is some doctrine. Why am I giving you that doctrine? One, because you're scattered, we could say, but keep it in the context of a message. What, if I'm giving you information, what must you have had before? No, no information. Either no information or worse, bad information. Does that make sense? Yep. So if in the context of a message, we have, um, we, have, we have good information here being given. And before that point, the reason this is even coming at all is because you either have bad information, bad or no information. And that needs to get solved that problem, because as we know, good information or bad information, information at all, um, eventually works upon the heart. You know, at some point it's going to, it's going to set your mind frame or your mindset and it's gonna work on your heart and it's either going to produce a good person or a bad person, depending on the information you have or bad actions at minimum or good actions, uh, depending on what you have. Um, so God needs to give information to deal with the problem of bad or no information. So another way someone said it before is you have darkness and then what do you have? Light. 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 In this light, the job of the light is to dispel the darkness. It is a, they go together. If you, the, the light's job function is to deal with that darkness. Or another way of saying it, the, the light is the message and it's to deal with the bad information. Or another way of saying it is, it is the solution to the problem. So there's always a problem. There's always a problem that precedes the time of the end that has to be dealt with. Do we see that? Always. There's, and, and how do we know that? What do we call, what, what, is, what is this line? What do we call that? Not the agricultural line, but the line I'm drawing here with the time of the end. I mean, you could call both of them the same thing, but. Reform. What? A reform line. It's a reform line. And what does it mean to reform? Change. To change something. So it is a line of change, which means that before the change arrives, you're in one state, and then the change, the message of change comes, and then you're going to be in another state. So a, re a reform line, by definition, acknowledges that there was a problem before, and a problem needs to get dealt with. And... <clears throat> The, now, the, the thing you have to determine is what the problem is and what is the solution. Um, and that identification of the problem and the solution is what is going to completely change the, your outlook or your, um, your perspective on the line that you're looking at, you know, how you handle that line or, or what it means, I guess. Um, so there's always the idea of problem and solution. And I'm going to keep saying that. Um, over the course of today and tomorrow several times uh, as we go through this.
So we're going to uh, we're going to end here. I think we have about a couple minutes left, uh, but I don't want to start this next next point before we're ready. Um, so we'll end here and we'll take our break and we'll come back at the appointed time. But what we've seen so far is we looked at Revelation 13, verse 11, and we saw that there's this intrinsic reference to the agricultural model. And we placed ourselves on the agricultural model um, here at the transition between the plowing and the former rain. And the next thing we did is we started looking at that quotation, which we spent a bit of time on. And we saw the compare and contrast that took place between these two beasts, the first beast and the second beast. And what happens now, or what we're, um, we saw the compare and contrast between these two things. And what we're gearing up to do when we get back from our break is we're going to take this concept of problem and solution and combined it with the idea of our theme, because again, the theme is the reason this thing is happening here. And we're going to um, see how that plays in this line here to help us determine the plowing history. Now, <clears throat> we said our theme is the, the controversy between religious and civil liberty versus religious and civil oppression. It's that controversy or that tension between the two of them, um, between the first beast and the second beast. And so what we should expect here in this reform line or this agricultural model that we're looking at is that the problem is going to be the first, the first beast. It's the idea of um, that oppression we're going to talk about in the solution is the introduction of liberty um, in a contrasting way. Uh, so we'll look at that next. That's where we'll start um, after our break. Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time that we've had. We ask that you'd bless the rest of it, Lord, and um, we pray that uh, you'd bless the communications we have going on, Lord, that you'd bless the, um, the networks, Lord, and the different um, technology that we're using, Lord, uh, that everything would go well. We pray that you would guide our hearts and our minds, Lord, to see the problem within ourselves, Lord, that you have um, undertaken this great effort, this great reform line to, um, to correct within us, Lord. And we thank you for that interest that you put into us and um, the value that you have for us. And we just pray that you would help us to identify those things in ourselves and that you would continue to guide us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.